Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Kino's uh, speech. Uh, it is a major honor uh, that we have uh, Professor uh, Christian Wiesel uh, to be with us and uh, have uh, this important uh, keynote speech. I'd like to, to say uh, 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 some, uh, uh, something about uh, 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 Professor Christian Wiesel's uh, outstanding uh, performance and the records. I'd like to highlight that uh, he's a member of uh, German Academy of Science, and also uh, he now is a political cultural research professor at uh, Lufano University uh, in Lunenburg, uh, Germany. He was also president and the vice president of the World Value Survey Association and the chief uh, foreign director of the Laboratory for Comparative Social Research at National Research University Higher School of Economics in St. Petersburg and Moscow, Russia. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Wazer's research focuses on uh, human empowerment, emancipatory, emancipative uh, uh, values, cultural change, and democratization. Uh, he uh, is a world uh, author of uh, more than 150 uh, books and uh, scholar articles, uh, including uh, his uh, award-winning uh, Freedom Rising publication in uh, 2013. Also, uh, other uh, important books, uh, including uh, Democratization, The Civic Culture Transform, and Modernization, Cultural Change, and the democracy. Uh, his current uh, research project, uh, including uh, a very interesting uh, project, uh, which is called uh, the cold water effect, the geoclimatic origin of Western civilizations emancipatory dynamic. Uh, let's uh, give a warm welcome uh, to Professor Christian Wiesel. Thank you very much for this lovely introduction and good morning everybody. It's always a pleasure uh, to be invited for a keynote until you realize they scheduled you for Saturday morning, <laughs> 9 o'clock, after a party like yesterday. Well, I'm surprised that the audience is even filled a little bit. Thanks for coming. I know a couple of colleagues and friends are here. Uh, some of them just out of sheer solidarity and not because of intellectual interest whatsoever, because they're going to know what I'm telling anyways. Um, well, I try. I try to talk about human progress, moral progress. Um, it's an attempt because uh, it's kind of daring to do this in these times. Uh, some of you might ask, is this guy from a different planet? Uh, in the era of Trump, Johnson, Duterte, Bolsonaro, and who else is in the club? You can just look around the world and we all are in the feeling that we are, that the ship of democracy is sinking in a swell of uh, right-wing populism almost everywhere. So how can you talk about progress? Well, um, I want to point out a couple of things uh, that we get a little bit more sober uh, in our gloomy views and don't throw the, the baby out with the tap water. Um, and I'm reporting, of course, as you might imagine, a little bit of evidence from the World Value Survey. And I talk about value change and what the driving factors are and the prevalent dynamics. And also, of course, that's the topic of today, how this is related to our subjective well-being. So are the value changes that we are observing, are they good for our subjective well-being, our life satisfaction, happiness, and so on? Or are they not? Or is there no effect at all? Um, the next graph actually is, is a simplification of the basic model that is uh, driving my thinking since many years. So I'm always starting from um, when I think about society's indicators, life quality, basically starting from existential conditions. Um, do people have access to food, to water, shelter? basic living conditions, material conditions, per capita incomes, housing, shelter, access to education, 
health services, public services, all these kinds of things that we measure all the time. Uh, for instance, with the Human Development Index and many, many other uh, indicators that are well known that describe our existential conditions. And if you simplify it, uh, you can schematize the world into like two opposite configurations. Um, on the left-hand side, when you have poverty, illiteracy, uh, diseases, um, crime, insecurity, collective violence, oppression, and all these kinds of things, life is mostly a source of threats, and people perceive it that way. Um, and actually, if you remember uh, Thomas Hobbes' uh, famous quote that life is short, brutish, and nasty, um, that was the state of nature for most of humanity for most of the time. Uh, things only started to change, at least for a chunk of the human population with the Industrial Revolution. And that also not from the beginning, because we had very poor working conditions in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Charles Dickens has described this in his novels. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels have given um, lucid descriptions of those um, dire situations. But then things started to improve. And uh, we got literacy, we got mass prosperity, we got welfare states, health services, and all the things that we now see in the post-industrial affluent world. And that has had a profound change on our, on our lives in the sense that life now turned from a source um, or the nature of life turned from a source of threats to suffer into a source of opportunities to thrive. So there was promise, there was potential. And that is changing psychological orientations accordingly. I don't know how many of you are um, familiar with the theory of regulatory focus in psychology. They make a distinction between two conditions in which the human mind can operate when we are coping with a challenge or a task. Uh, one is the prevention focus, which you can trigger in every human being by exposing a person to threat. Um, and prevention focus is a, is a situation where the mind kind of closes. When people, for instance, are asked to do exam questions or some sort of quizzes or tests, and you put them in a prevention focus, what they would do, they would do first all the routine tasks and go to the difficult stuff that needs creativity later. So you would, like, avoid failure. That would be the, the maximizing strategy. So it's a very protective um, set of um, state of mind. Uh, promotion focus is triggered when you um, offer people opportunities. So you confront them with a challenge, but you're not um, priming people that, hey, if you make a failure, you're getting subtractions or punishment. No, you say, hey, if you make uh, good points, then you can gain something. Yeah. So promotion focus, prevention focus. And I think that's what's happening when life conditions are changing mentalities are changing as a natural psychological adaption to these situations. And the interesting thing about this is you need no political program, you need no master, you need no orchestrated strategy to make those mindset changes happening when life conditions are changing. Um, so this is a natural human reaction to living conditions and it's universally human uh, according to our theory. Um, and you can see this um, with three measures that are around in cross-cultural psychology and have been widely used. One is the most famous and the oldest one is collectivism versus individualism, going back to Harry Triandis and Hofstede and Michel Minkoff. And um, societies have been scored on those, uh, on those psychological measures. Another one is from Shalom Schwartz, uh, from his values circle, where we have uh, one dimension that goes from embeddedness to autonomy. And uh, a third one is related, uh, or comes from the World Values Survey, uh, which is obedient versus emancipative values. Emancipative values, about which I will talk a little bit more, is a set of orientations where people emphasize freedom of choice, so there is a libertarian component and equality of opportunity. So there is an egalitarian component. When those two go together, I'm talking about emancipative values. And we measure them with a set of 12 items. They are related to 
gender equality, so do women have equal access or should they? have equal access to politics, to education, to the job market. It's related to child rearing attitudes. Are we educating our children to be critical of authorities, creative, independent in their thinking? Or is it about faith, obedience, diligence, um, and these more traditional kinds of things? And we also ask about things that also go in this index of emancipative values, about uh, various tolerance um, aspects, tolerance of homosexuality, for instance, and other things. Um, now, if you take those three measures, um, individualism, collectivism, autonomy, uh, embeddedness, emancipation, uh, obedience, and you correlate them across the, well, we have it for 60 countries where all three measures are available, you get correlations 0 0.8, 0 0.9, if you run a factor analysis across this uh, it will tell you there is one dimension uh, on which all those three indicators um, are loading. So this is basically measuring the same thing from just different theoretical angles. And um, if I put an umbrella term about this, this is about a prevention versus a, a promotive orientation that is behind this. Now, the good thing, although we keep forgetting this sometimes, uh, because gloomy news always uh, make the headlines, um, no one is reporting that since 1975 no famine in the world has happened again. No one is reporting today not another thousand people died of a terrorist attack. So the good news are usually underreported and heavily so compared to the bad news. So sometimes it's healthy just to remind ourselves how the world has been developing over the past uh, 50, 60 years. Um, and here uh, we have evidence from the World Values Survey. This is now, just to zoom in for a moment, this is now only for Western uh, long-standing democracies. So these are also post-industrial societies. So this picture covers the United States, Germany, Sweden, France, Italy, Canada, and so on, and so forth, even South Korea. And um, we have weighted the data by population size, so the US, has a heavier weight here in this picture than Iceland uh, would have for obvious reasons. Um, and what we see is cohort differences. So here you see when people are born, and the more to the right you go, the younger they are. And here we see the cohort profile that happened in 1981-83. And then we see it in the most recent survey. And I have just plotted the data from wave seven of the World Value Survey, with just turning in those data, um, the thing would be even higher up. Yeah. So the trend is, uh, is continuing. So we have a rise of emancipative values. In the beginning, this is interesting, um, when the survey was done the first time and we saw this age profile, we had a huge discussion in our community whether these are cohort effects or life cycle effects. Because some people argued, hey, look, um, Young people are always so passionate and enthusiastic. Of course, they have emancipative values. They want freedom and liberty and all those kinds of things. Wait until they age and you will see they will become more conservative. That was a real possibility. Um, this picture shows you this has nothing to, 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 uh, to do with life cycle effects. These are real cohort effects. So as generational replacement happens, whole societies are becoming more emancipatory. Well. That's true for the Western world. But what's going on in the rest of the world? And we were stunned um, by what we find. So in this picture, um, we pulled countries into culture zones. It's a little bit inspired by Arnold Toynbee's circles of civilization or uh, Samuel Huntington civilizations. So we have, some of them are self-telling, Sub-Saharan Africa, well, uh, our countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Reformed West, to explain this a little bit, are countries in Western Europe that went through the Reformation. So mostly Protestant Western Europe. Uh, the New West is the extension of those countries into the colonial world. So this would be the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. The Old West would be those countries in Europe that were core parts of the Roman Empire and for that reason are mostly Catholic. So this would be about Italy, Spain, France, Portugal, 
and so on. Um, Return West is those parts of uh, ex-communist Eastern Europe that were either Catholic or Protestant and returned to the European Union after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Um, Orthodox East is basically a post-Soviet space dominated by Orthodox Russia, historically speaking. Um, so this would be Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, Armenia, Georgia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and so forth. Um, Latin America self-explanatory. Islamic East would be the Middle East and North Africa. Um, Indic East is South Asia, basically speaking, and the countries that have been imprinted by Indian culture, mostly. And Xenic East is um, East Asia, China. Um, yeah, and what you see here, if you plot emancipative values from the youngest generation in each of those cultural, civilized, cultural zones uh, to, the, to the oldest civilization and make this arrow, uh, from the oldest to the youngest, you see what you see. And that is, if those generational differences indeed are footprints of cultural change over time, uh, which the previous graph has shown us is most likely the case, then we can see the world is moving, and it's mostly moving in an emancipatory direction. I have subdivided the emancipative values index here in two components so we can display this on a two-dimensional map. Well, um, what we can also do if we know that the cohort differences are indeed, excuse me, um, are indeed generational and not um, age or life cycle effects, then uh, the cohort differences give us the footprints of cultural change as it happened in the past. So what we can do we can transpose the cohort differences into a time series, backward in time. Yeah. And this is what we have done in, in, in this exercise for 100 countries. And this is a kind of a funny kind of data exercise because now you can create from a cross-section a time-pooled cross-sectional data set with yearly observations and that offers you a lot of opportunities for statistical um, analysis, especially with panel regressions. But anyways, we wanted just to see, uh, because in my theory of human empowerment, three elements have to come together in order to qualify a society as one that has a lot of human empowerment. So where people have the possibility to pursue actions and desires of their choice. Um, I'm always arguing there are three things that have to come together. One is living conditions, as I talked about before, enabling conditions. This is about education, material living conditions, and connective opportunities. Yeah. Do we have the chance to connect to like-minded others because of means of communication, transportation, mobility, and so on and so forth? This is what we see here. And here we have um, objective indicators. A second thing that has to be in the game uh, for human empowerment to be in place is institutions. Of course, we need to be allowed um, to do the things we want to do. And this is about human rights, civil rights, civil liberties, democracy. And we have very good measures in the meanwhile, especially about liberal democracy from the Varieties of Democracy Project in Gothenburg, Sweden, who do a wonderful job, by the way. Well, and then I wanted to see how, so it's all like um, normed on a scale from zero to one, how would over time, so we can backward project emancipative values all the way to 1960, uh, further back in time we just lose cases because we don't have people so old in our service that we can make these backward projections and have um, valid averages. And you see this amazing uh, parallelity in this movement, uh, which really tells me that these backward projections um, have a grain of credibility, even though we never have been in this time making surveys. So, but um, <laughs> it's pretty clear. Um, this is a progressive story. And of course, if you break this down to different areas in the world, the picture becomes a little bit more heterogeneous, as you might imagine. But nevertheless, you will, what you would see if you make breakdowns by regions, you will see that the intercepts 
are very different. Sub-Saharan Africa is in a very low intercept. Um, Europe, um, the rich countries are in a very high intercept. But the slopes are almost everywhere the same, except for a shrinking number of travel spots in the world where we have failed states, like Darfur, Somalia, South Sudan, Afghanistan, Syria. Um, but the number of those places is shrinking. If you look, for instance, at a map from the 1970s, and every spot has a flame where there is war or civil war, you would see South America plastered, Africa plastered, Asia plastered, and today it's really a shrinking number of places where this is happening. It's bad enough, but things are improving and they are improving in most regions of the world. Um, okay, I skipped that. Now, what's the idea now with subjective well-being? Um, what we believe is humans are extremely adaptive, psychologically uh, adaptive. Uh, we know from studies of prisoners, for instance, that they are not falling into dire depression for the rest of their lives. They somehow adjust to their conditions, and it's known from genetic studies of life satisfaction that when people experience a big loss um, or a big gain, like in the lottery, their life satisfaction is peaking or dipping, but usually they return back to what's called as their, as their set point. So people are very capable to adjust. And that means that people were even able to achieve happiness back in time when they were oppressed peasants with a harsh work schedule where others were bossing them around, where they had to give away their produce, where they had every day the fear of sickness, of famine, of starving, and stuff like this. Still, people had sources of um, finding moments of happiness. And one of them, uh, very important, so, and this is probably what explains part of the power of religion in history, is that religion is a source of subjective well-being. Why? Well, in a dire world, it's a source of hope. It's um, giving comfort, it's giving meaning and purpose. Religion also comes with cults and rituals where people come together. So this is also giving a feeling of belongingness, uh, which is very important for our collective selves, for our identities. So for all these reasons, religion is definitely a source of happiness. And it has been reported in many studies that there is a positive correlation between individuals' level of religiosity and their level of subjective well-being. It has been reported in dozens of studies, and it has been reported across different religious denominations. So it doesn't matter if you are Muslim, Jew, Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Protestant, Catholic. Um, in all these de denominations, we have studied it, studies that show more religious people tend to be more happy. Which is a very interesting observation. But even more interesting is, it has also been reported that these correlations vary in strength. In some countries, for instance in the United States, the correlation between individual level religiosity and life satisfaction is stronger than in Sweden. So why is this? Um, so these differences have been reported, but no one really reported a clear pattern. Why do we have this variation in the strength by which happiness relates to religiosity? And then we came across a different um, branch of literature where another source of happiness was discussed. In psychology it's known as locus of control or feelings of agency. So having the subjective impression that I am in control of my life and that I have a choice about what I'm doing can change my world and even parts of the world around me. We call this feelings of freedom. In the World Value Survey we have a question on that that is one of my favorite questions indeed, where we ask people, generally speaking, do you think that you have no choice whatsoever of how your life is progressing and turning out or do you think you have a great deal of choice measured on a scale from one, no choice at all, to ten, perfect amount of choice? So this is what we mean with freedom. 
subjectively felt freedom. Whether this, how this relates to objective freedom is again a different question. Huh? But this is what we mean. And um, it has been reported, uh, especially in the um, field of uh, DC and Ryan self-determination theory, um, that uh, feelings of freedom are positively related to levels of happiness. And here again, people have reported that the strength of that correlation varies from one country to the next. It's usually positive, but the strength of the correlation is a variable. And why is that? Now we started to think, um, this is what I did together with Misho Minkov, um, we started to think about, this is kind of weird, uh, because if you think about felt freedom and religious faith, these are two very different states of mind, actually a little bit in tension to each other, if you recognize that religious faith is often about believing into fate and destiny. Um, and that someone else up there, God, is doing things and having a choice. But we are predestined. Predestination is actually a core uh, dogma of Calvinism. Uh, but it's, uh, the elements are, uh, are present in all religious denominations. So it's kind of actually having no choice. Things are regulated by divine powers. And then having a choice, is this feeling of agency is almost the opposite. So I'm controller, I'm in the driver's seat. I don't need divine intervention in order to, make, to change things to the better. So how can these kind of slightly opposing um, things both be a source of happiness? If so, we thought maybe there is an inverse relationship that where happiness is strongly based on religious feelings, it might be not very strongly attached to freedom and the other way around. So this was the first hypothesis, an uh, inverse relationship between two correlations, the correlation between religiousness and happiness and the correlation between freedom and happiness. An inverse relationship between the two was one hypothesis. And the second one was, we thought the driving force that determines where on this inverse relationship a society or a given human being is located is determined by those psychological orientations which relate back to existential basic living conditions. So when people are on the promotive side, emancipatory, individualistic, autonomous, then in those situations freedom will be more important than religion for their happiness. And if it's the opposite, if they are in a prevention focus, um, religion will be more important for their happiness than freedom. A third hypothesis was, oh, well, a sort of a speculation. Now you can think, um, here's a person whose happiness depends on her or his religious faith. Here's another person, and the first person is very preventive oriented. And there's another person promotively oriented whose happiness does not depend at all on religion. This, people, this person might be an atheist, but depends very much on her or his feeling of freedom. Now you could ask, which vehicle is more powerful? Is religion a better source, a more powerful source of happiness? Or is freedom a more powerful source of happiness? I had a relatively clear hypothesis um, based on the research that has shown that when people, well, all kinds of ways lead to Rome, um, so all kinds of vehicles can lead to happiness, but maybe some are faster and more efficient. And some of the literature suggests that people who pursue intrinsic strategies in their life, so self-driven, um, they achieve better happiness than people who follow extrinsic motivations. And also, we know that as for the society at large, um, what kind of strategies people, uh, people follow is, is an important aspect of the common good. So I see Francesco here has done a lot about relation of goods. People who do intrinsic, um, follow intrinsic motivations are often engaging themselves in non-zero-sum games. So for instance, if you're a member of an orchestra, and you play the violin very well, 
you do not suffer if your neighbors in the same role also play it well. Actually, the opposite. Yeah? So these are positive externalities. However, if you follow an extrinsically motivated strategy, so you want to get richer, you want to get a bigger yard and a bigger house, um, what you get, someone else is losing. These are serious sum games. Yeah? So, depending on the, the prevalent type of games most people in the society are engaging, will have effects on the overall well-being of that entire society. Well, our hypothesis was that freedom is a more powerful source of happiness than religion, and that might be actually, huh, sort of, if that's indeed true, this might be a selective force on how we evolve over history. But that's a little bit speculative, I admit. Um, anyways. Here we have, um, this is from the study that Misho Minkov has done. This is not World Value Survey data. He has done a 50-nation study, um, internet recruited. Uh, so there's a couple of um, caveats uh, with the sampling method. But anyways, um, we could measure collectivism versus individualism. And we here see um, the further down um, uh, countries are located here on the scale, the stronger is the correlation between happiness and religion. And the more up they are, the stronger is the correlation between happiness and freedom. And this is pretty much a confirmation of our initial hypothesis that as psychological orientations turn more promotive and less preventive, so more individualistic, um, and you could say this is also about emancipative values, but because I have shown you before, those measures are pretty much the same. So this seems to be indeed the case. Um, I'll skip over this. Um, we have this also from, and this is then from the World Value Survey, which is confirmatory. This is actually a little bit older. This, this is from my book, Freedom Rising, uh, in chapter five where we see emancipative values from left to right, these emancipative values are getting stronger. And um, here we see how much people's um, subjective well-being, this is a question on life satisfaction, how much this is driven by intrinsic motivations and, or by agency feelings, so feeling freedom. And here, this shows how much it is driven by financial household satisfaction, which are labeled extrinsic um, well-being here. And you see, this is a flip over. Um, when the values are changing, um, the, the factors that determine our happiness are fundamentally changing as well. And that, you can imagine, this will affect our behavior, and this will affect everyone's behavior, so it will affect how entire societies are operating. So this is fundamentally important knowledge that we have here. Um, haha, yeah, the, here's, here's the thing. So what this measures now is how much do people emphasize an intrinsic over an extrinsic strategy in finding happiness. And we see that this matters for the overall level of well-being in a society. So in a society where more people are following intrinsic motivations to achieve happiness, the overall level of life satisfaction in that society is higher. Interestingly, if you do a multi-level model, you will find that the contextual effect is more powerful than the individual effect. So it is not such that an individual, her or himself, is higher in life satisfaction than the average in her society when she herself is pursuing an intrinsic strategy. No, it's when the rest of the society in which I'm living is doing that. That has a powerful impact. So it's contextual. So it's about social relations and the social environment. <coughs> well. Um, but let me relate this now to a debate that is going on in political science, which is very, very heated. And it's a very gloomy debate. Um, Fifteen years back, um, we were 
in a face of a great euphoria about the prospects of democracy in the world, we had actually a branch of literature that was called the transition literature. So you had dozens of books, bookshelves of libraries filled with studies why authoritarian dictatorships transit to democracy in so many countries. Now, in the meanwhile, we have a complete uh, mood swing in the discipline, but also in public discourse. And one of the um, leaders of the new gloom, um, as I call it, is um, Roberto Foa and Yasha Maunk, who have published in the Journal of Democracy two articles that went viral, literally speaking. And they're now proper um, advocates of what they call the deconsolidation thesis. We had since a longer time a discussion in political science, also in sociology, about like um, what are the crisis elements that we observe in our modern day democracies. And Robert Putnam was one of the first uh, to pinpoint certain worrisome trends. Uh, one of them being declining voter turnout, declining memberships in parties and various other voluntary associations and also indications of growing dissatisfaction with democracy, declining trust in institutions, and especially the declining trust in institutions was particularly worrisome for many people because many scholars think that if trust in institutions is not there, a representative democracy which needs institutions cannot work. So you will have policy failure, social disruption, and eventually even maybe the breakdown of the democratic institutions themselves. Then there was a revisionist camp, however, and I was always part of that, to be honest, who argued that um, low public trust is not, not such a bad thing in the first place. Um, we actually argued that the rise of emancipative values is a critical force that elevates people's standard of expectation, and then the reality, even if the reality is rosy, is more likely to fall short of those expectations as people measure them against higher standards. Then people get, yes, they get some dissatisfaction, but then they're also going on the street, raising their voices, protesting, demonstrating, signing petitions, all these kinds of stuff, and that creates pressure on the institutions and the elites to be responsive to public demands. And then, as an effect, the institutions actually improve. So we had a much more um, optimistic view on what the public opinion data were showing. So there were two camps confronted with the same evidence, but drawing very different conclusions how to interpret those indicators, especially as it comes to declining trust in institutions. Um, anyways, now, um, unfortunately, I have to say from my perspective, the debate has turned in favor um, of the pessimists again, and with a vengeance. Um, and Roberto Faure and Yasha Monk, are, as I said, are the, the advocates of this. So what are they arguing? Um, we were kind of um, in agreement in the discipline that yes, maybe our initial views after the third wave of democratization about the future of democracy, think of Fukuyama, the end of history and the last man, uh, who argued that liberal democracy will remain the only legitimate model of how a country can be governed and it will win. Um, that was in 1990. Um, we agreed that is probably a little bit uh, too euphoric. And uh, we were also a little bit too euphoric in, uh, in seeing that democracy also has cultural foundations and it just does travel everywhere. Yeah. You need to have a population with a prevalent mindset for democratic institutions to work. Uh, we agreed on that. But then we thought, okay, maybe democracy has problems in, in Orbán's Hungary and in the Kaczynski's uh, Poland, and it vanished in Russia. It's about to vanish in Turkey, yes, but the West is safe. Now, this is where these two guys that I mentioned now uh, brought in a significant turn in the debate because they now say no. Deconsolidation. Democracy is losing its roots in the most mature Western democracies. And they claim to show data that um, support for democracy is in decline 
in all mature democracies and especially among the young generation. So they're turning their back to democracy. And their fading passion for democracy, they imply, is actually one of the reasons why we have swelling, illiberal, nativist, right-wing, however you call that, populism. And we are at the brink of a dark era. Some people even compare the situation of today with the 1930s. Actually, there is a competition among intellectuals who makes the most gloomy um, prediction. Um, so, I thought the generational story, something is wrong here. Because I remember uh, a, 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 a diagram that Pippa Norris has shown me. No, it was actually Steven Pinker. Uh, where you see the age profile of uh, Brexit voters and the age profile of Trump voters. Stunning. And it's the opposite of what Thor and Monga are telling. This young people have no support for those guys and those issues, and it's the older people. So something must be wrong about the generational story here. And I think they get a lot of things wrong, because if we look in the data from the World Value Survey, um, speaking ab about a generational decline in support for democracy, I really don't see that. If you actually use a question on support for democracy as a dependent variable and plug in people's age as the explanatory variable, the explained variance you get is 0.01%. So age explains nothing when it comes to support for democracy. And this is where the debate is misleading because all of this discussion is hiding over the real story. Because what has changed is the type of democracy supporter, the moral type of democracy supporter. So if we divide our populations at the median into two moral tribes, uh, the one tribe is people who are not endorsing emancipative values. So those people are largely illiberal in their attitudes. They hate homosexuals, they don't want gender equality, they think their children need to learn authority and obedience and these kinds of things and we don't want immigrants. Um, so this moral tribe. And there's another one um, that takes exactly the opposite positions. And then we look into the generations, what has happened, and then we see that the moral tribes, so the dark gray ones, are the illiberal. So they still, it's amazing that they still say they support democracy. So you wonder what they mean when they say that. Um, obviously something else than the liberal ones. And the, li the light gray ones are the liberal supporters of democracy. And you see there's a, trend, uh, there's a huge generational transformation in the prevalent type of supporter of democracy. In the meanwhile, we have also data where we can look at, do they have different understandings of democracy? And they do. The illiberal ones, as it suggests, are the ones who do not care so much about checks and balances, separation of powers, critical media, independent judiciary, and these kinds of things, uh, minority rights. Whereas the liberal supporters are, again, taking exactly the opposite positions. So the generational story is a very different one from what is currently in the debate. And, um, well, we have measures of democracy across 180 countries in the world, and we have these measures of support for democracy for about 100 countries in the world. So we can run a, a, a correlation and look at how large is the percentage of illiberal supporters for democracy in a country, and how large is the percentage of liberal supporters of democracy in a country, and correlate that with a country's actual level of democracy as it is measured by experts like those from the varieties of democracy project. And you got a very, very clear picture here. Um, the quality of democracy is better in countries where we have more liberal supporters. The quality of democracy is worse in countries where we have more illiberal supporters of democracy. So the conclusion would be um, that, that, that generation change is a good thing for the quality of democratic institutions. Um, but now you will probably, and this is my last point for today, you will probably now ask, how can you then explain the rise 
of illiberal populism that we have seen over the last five, six, seven years. How can that happen? Many media pundits and analysts leave us with the impression that the, elect that the, 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 the electoral success of those populist parties is the consequence of that the electorate, so the size of the population who supports such, such positions has been growing. In fact, what we are going to show is the size of that population segment has been shrinking and quite big time so. So what we have is a phenomenon of over-mobilization of a voter segment that has for a large chunk of time turned in the camp of non-voters. They have been mobilized uh, recently by populist forces because the old parties didn't address their concerns. This is what we see. is not a growth um, of those attitudes and the population segments supporting those attitudes. So what I mean I'm looking in particular at this uh, quadrant here. So disaffection, uh, this refers to the very prevalent anti-establishment rhetoric that is common for all populist parties. Uh, they always talk against the establishment. Um, and of course, they have illiberal values against immigration, against homosexual tolerance, against gay rights, against gender equality, um, and these kinds of things. So we're looking at this particular segment of the population. By the way, um, we know from mobilization research that smaller groups are easier to mobilize uh, than larger groups. We also can show that in the moment as this quadrant, so people falling into this lower right quadrant as the population segment that belongs to here has been shrinking, it has, however, become more sharp in its social profile. Uh, these people have always been more male, um, older, less educated, more rural, uh, tending to be in more precarious occupations. But over time, these characteristics have become more pronounced. So if we go back to the mid-1990s and plug in age, gender, education, uh, rural or urban residents, and a couple of other social demographic factors to explain as a dependent variable how much do people sympathize with right-wing populism. You get an explained variance of 5-6% individual level data. If you do this now, the explained variance doubles or triples. So that means those characteristics have become a more pronounced, a more sharp profiling um, element of those people. And then, of course, um, a more sharply profiled segment in the population is also easier to address. <clears throat> and this is what we see. Um, over the generations, basically the same thing in both uh, pictures, except for in the, in the right one, I added a, a, a really xenophobic um, attitude. Um, to, to the thing, but you get the same picture. Generation-wise considered, right-wing populism is on a declining slope, and also over time it has been dropping. And that gives me hope for the future because, um, ah, here you see this. Um, so you see correlations of this right-wing populism with certain different other attitudes and you see them in the most recent survey and in the, in the survey in the most earliest survey where we have those data. And you see that the blue bars are always reaching out wider than the red bars. And that means these correlations have been growing. This is what I mean with the social profiling has sharpened of this population segment. And it has also shrunk. That's very clear. So the, the success of those parties has nothing to do with that uh, whole publics are turning uh, more towards uh, their course. Um, and you have seen in the last uh, European Parliament elections, um, we had a huge mobilization effect. So the voter turnout went up big time uh, from 40% to over 60%. And largely so because young voters in particular have been mobilized. And we have seen this was a huge containment uh, to the populist parties who did not perform as well at all as it was predicted, actually, other parties, the Greens and, and some others, and the Liberals also, uh, profited from, 
from this. So um, I would argue that the current successes of populism are already uh, branded with an expiration date, so this is not the wave of the future. Um, I would not go so far that we have just to wait uh, for generational replacement uh, to do the job. No, I would say young people should go vote uh, and should mobilize their, their, their fellows. And then we are looking into a brighter future again, and I hope this is a little bit of an upbeat uh, mood swing for the audience today morning, and I'm now very curious, two questions, and uh, of course, critical comments. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Christian uh, Wiesel. Uh, we have uh, a very uh, precious uh, 15 minutes at least for quick Q&A. So uh, please uh, take this chance. I see several hands here and then there. Okay, go first. Okay, go first. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Fumi Saito. Uh, I'm coming from Japan. Uh, I belong to Ryukoku University, which was established as a Buddhist university 380 years ago. Um, I have read some of your books, and I was quite impressed with your presentation as well. Um, your framework uh, presents uh, prevention and promotion in a very dichotomistic way. And for analytical purposes, uh, I think that yields us some explanatory power, uh, and therefore that, that seems to be very useful. But on the other hand, um, I have a problem with that sort of very dichotomized way of, of uh, you know, uh, presenting collectivism, individualism, embeddedness, autonomy as well. As, as I said, I'm coming from the Buddhist university. In the religion of Buddhism, one of the key uh, beliefs is that one life doesn't exist in separation from all other lives. So all lives are interdependent. So what's important is the nature of interdependence. So if we ask a question like collectivism and individualism, uh, that that's certainly useful to some extent, but in other sense, that's, that's in a sense very odd, because we need both individualism and collectivism, and we need uh, interdependence among different lives. So I'm curious if I say that uh, the very dichotomized way of understanding uh, is, on the other hand, use, useful, but if it's, on the other hand, mis possibly misleading, uh, what would be your reaction? Thank you very much. Thanks for the question. I'm actually very happy about that question. Um, I think that a former colleague of mine, um, Uli Kühnen at Jacobs University, would very much agree with your question. And because of him, I also became um, familiar with the work of uh, Kitayama and independent and uh, interdependent self construals and these kinds of things. And um, you are obviously an Asian person, so you should be interdependent. I'm a Western person, I should be <laughs> independent to have another dichotomy. No, yeah, of course, right. The, the dichotomy is only a pedagogical purpose. Um, uh, actually, I think in terms of a continuum where there is a spectrum and there can be gray-shaded um, areas in between, and I think every individual has elements of both. Um, they are also functional for, for, for two different things. Sometimes, uh, it's, but you are indeed right, this is a kind of a, a Western legacy to think in those juxtapositions, tight versus loose cultures is, is another one, which I think is a misconception. Uh, I could talk about that uh, for some time. Um, yeah, I also think that uh, the, I use the expression collectivism because it has from the beginning been branded that way. And I think it's a misnomer. Because individualistic persons, as I understand them, those that have emancipative values are very engaged in the society. So 
What I think is, what happens is that the form of collectivism is changing as we move from more traditional to modern societies. In modern societies, we have universal schemes of solidarity, universal health care, universal pension scheme. So solidarity is impartial. Uh, in more traditional societies, um, that is more in-group oriented. Uh, I think that's the difference. But I thank you for the question. I agree with you, actually. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for a rousing presentation. Um, maybe as a caveat to some of your points, uh, I like, I'm a young man from Belgium, Brussels. Uh, the example of Turkey and Belgium are a little bit disturbing in, in your scheme because those are countries where voting is obligatory. And, um, and in both countries, populism has been on the rise. Um, the, what, what is very interesting here you, is what your hypothesis is that the uh, emancipation of the anti-emancipatory people you know, by the turnout of the votes, etc., which is seen in the UK, America, etc. But there is another observation in Belgium which I think is fascinating. It is that in the northern part, Flanders, there the far right parties and populists, you, you, you must call them, have been have had a huge success in the last elections last year. And in the southern part, Wallonia, uh, not at all. But surveys done on the preoccupations, the values, the, the concerns of the people were absolutely similar in the north and in the south. The difference was the, uh, uh, not the, on the demand side, but on the supply side of political parties. There were political parties it, taking the populist stand in the north and none in the south. Puzzling to me. Please comment. Um, yes, you are right. This is my side. My, my story was completely focusing on the on the demand side. I did not uh, say anything about uh, the, the supply side, which means how political parties position themselves in in the political space. Um, I would refer you to a recent paper by uh, Herbert Kitchell who has uh, analyzed this realignment uh, that happened in, in Western publics uh, to, in favor of, uh, of populism. And uh, what, what he is arguing is that um, we have had a voter segment that is, as I said, he agrees with that, that is shrinking. If you think about the old working class, like Rust Belt in the United States, uh, old industrial hubs, um, low educated, usually also low income or low below median income. Um, the concerns of those people have in the past been addressed, uh, usually by center-left parties, by offering redistributional pro-welfare state um, policies, working conditions and stuff like this. And um, as he argues, as the center-left parties moved in their economic positions more towards a neoliberal stance, like uh, new Labour under Tony Blair, uh, the Social Democrats in Germany under Gerhard Schröder. Um, they lost the appeal of those voters who did not move immediately to another camp, but became non-voters for the longest time. And also, um, those voters could be picked up by two forces, uh, center-left parties with economic positions, or center-right parties by moral conservatism. But if you have a situation like in Germany, when the SPD, the Social Democrats, economically move to the center, and the Christian Democrats morally move under Merkel into a very progressive direction, no one addresses those voters anymore. And that is a situation that opens an ideological void where then those parties can step in. But I think we have to look at this country by country because the landscapes and the public discourses have their national specificities. Yeah, but you are absolutely right. We have to look at that. Thank, thank you for your presentation. Um, I live, I live in, in, in Barcelona, uh, as part of uh, Catalonia and part of Spain. You know, 
we have a kind uh, of phenomena that I call catexy, that means that's similar or, or have some relationship with the Brexit. And I will appreciate some, some comments on these two phenomena, especially the Brexit that I saw that I, I expect that you have reflected on that phenomena. Um, well, I did. Um, in fact, uh, this is kind of funny um, because my wife is from California and there is also a movement for Calexit. If Trump gets another term, I think that will <laughs> receive a little bit more support. I was actually caught in a, uh, in a Plaza Mayor in Barcelona in one of the demonstrations that were happening. I was invited for a talk in, in the mayor hall and um, that was very interesting to see the emotional energy that, that was mobilized. But I think that um, there are, it's a little bit different from the situation in, in the UK um, and I don't want to go to, in too much detail here into that. Hello, my name is Annie Tupaji and I wanted to connect the dots from what you presented and uh, the last comment. So the religiosity is, uh, you said, a source of um, a religion itself, is a source of trying to find hope, right? So uh, what I find out for um, Brexit and for UK is that uh, the, not the religiosity but the superstition has grown really crazily. In 2011, they had something like 60,000 people self-identifying as witches in modern UK. And this, uh, the special concentration of these witches predicts the Brexit vote. So the religiosity, you can think of it as um, just a mechanism for alleviating the pain, for not being able to achieve extrinsic things. So you find some kind of intrinsic motivation, which is just a substitute, there's a, there's a trade-off between the two, to cancel another uh, you know, And then uh, you can see this also elsewhere. You can see it in the, uh, in the United States, you can see there the, uh, whatever you want, the, the flat earthers or uh, the prosperity gospel or any other kind of uh, new uh, hope. So maybe you can see, I haven't checked this one, but maybe you can also see it. Um, there might be a decline of religiosity, right? So re the, the official religion goes away. What comes is new waves of quite bizarre <laughs> substitutes. And definitely one of the bizarre substitutes, which is in the UK, is a very good explanatory power, has, has a very good explanatory power. I have already found it. And for this, I have evidence. Uh, predicts the bizarre uh, political vote. And I would think the same might be true for a whole year because we know that the religiosity has been declining over the years. So this was a thing I wanted to draw the attention to. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, I wasn't aware of those data, um, but that makes a lot of sense to me. I would actually argue there is um, religiosity, but also nationalism and all kinds of other collectivisms. I would call them tribalisms. Um, they all follow the same psychological pattern. We rally around the flag, and it's also always having the tendency to de-individuate people and make them part of the cult and, uh, and commanding a wholesale loyalty. And, uh, it's no, and unity is then very important, and this is an ident it's a very powerful identity, psychologically identity factor. And I think it resonates extremely strong with people who have these left-behind feelings. And they have them for a reason. They are not um, unreal. Um, when certain population segments, I'm, in Germany we talk about the precariat, when they turn into a camp of non-voters, no matter who is in power, those preferences are, do, do not count in, in policy making. And um, we have actually some good evidence from political science data on this. Um, 
And then, of course, these feelings of left behind are real, and they, um, yeah, they're, they're actually searching for a home. And the populists um, can come in very different colors and with very different garments, but the psychological strategies are always the same to create this identity that creates the unity and then you are part of a strong group and that is then a source of satisfaction. And that, as, as you say, that can, can come in different versions. May I add something? I made a propensity score matching between the witches and the identical peers. And just as you say, they're always at the worst of uh, situation in terms of their income and also they're more deprived than their identical peers. And th this is of course just signaling, right? Because this happens in 2011 and then the Brexit was 2016. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to go back to the supply versus uh, supply versus demand debate. Uh, I just read recently a book that said that the young generations indeed have more emancipatory uh, values, but they don't necessarily believe in parties. So do you think it might be a matter of design of democracy? Do we have to invent a new form of democratic uh, uh, representation? Uh, very important point. Um, another colleague of mine has been talking about the separation of democratic spaces. So uh, what he means is that uh, the older generation still uses the traditional means of participation, voter turnout, voting for parties, and this is not attractive for young people. So we see uh, Greta and Fridays for Future. So young people like to go on the street and uh, have a fun event and protest. And um, this is more appealing to them. We have, I think, um, however, to clarify to people that this separation of democratic spaces doesn't work because if you keep doing this, you go losing elections all the time and then you have more reasons to protest. If you would go to the polls in the first place, maybe you have less reasons to go on the street thereafter. Um, but we have seen it's possible in the European Parliament elections. Uh, young voters came out in much bigger numbers, but this is what parties really have to think about, to make themselves more attractive again also for younger people especially. I mean, there is a lot of experimentation going on uh, with probation memberships and then all kinds of stuff and opening the parties um, for primaries and, and all kinds of things we can think of. Um, I think there's stuff going on, yeah. Uh, when I uh, are reading uh, your resume, the last line is kind of very interesting. It's about the climate change, and it has something to do with emancipative value. Could you? It's your new project. Can you, you know, uh, uh, say something about this? I think uh, would uh, would be very uh, interesting you, uh, for this uh, new idea. All right. Very briefly. So this was maybe I go back to one slide. Um, that I jumped or skipped over. Um, so what you see here on the horizontal axis is what this new project is about. It's a cool, so-called cool water project. Um, it's a little bit inspired by Jared Diamond uh, and his idea is how geoclimatic conditions can influence how societies develop. Um, I came across since this long time and I was kind of a hobby horse for a while, but in the meanwhile I got a huge grant uh, to pursue this a uh, little bit further. So what I'm doing is I create a, an index that measures uh, the combination of co uh, cool seasons, so frosty winters and cool summers in combination with continuous steady rain and um, then a country gets a so-called cool water score and I figured out by simple correlation analysis that this cool water index um, correlates with everything um, that is an indicator of development from life expectancy to per capita GDP to corruption to democracy to emancipative values to happiness to trust. Whatever you take, there is always a very powerful 
correlation, which made me started me to believe maybe there is something behind that. Um, and I got into a lot, number of papers. There was one paper, for instance, that shows like bad, bad weather uh, makes people more productive. And I did a study in Japan and in the United States. And uh, when it's raining or it's cold outside. So people do not think about hanging out outdoors or going to a picnic. So they stay inside. So what are you doing inside? You only get bored by watching videos all the time. So at one point you start to work and, and do something. So productivity levels go up. So this is the simplistic story of this. Uh, this um, already Montesquieu had a very elaborate uh, uh, sections in his uh, De l'Esprit de Loire, uh, where he argued, uh, why do you have slavery being more prevalent in tropical areas? Uh, well, when white uh, colonizers go there and you have 80% humidity and it's 40 degrees, you don't want to work yourself at all. So you enslave people. Um, so there's a couple of factors behind it, uh, not only on the ridiculous side, um, so this is what this project is about. So I really try to figure out if this is a spurious correlation or if there is really some, something more substantive um, behind it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Christian Weather, uh, to come to uh, East School uh, Conference at Granada. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoy the cooler weather uh, today. It was hot uh, uh, two days before, and uh, also I'd like to, to, to uh, uh, wish uh, all of you also, uh, in light of this cooler uh, weather uh, uh, theory, we have a better uh, conference, the last day uh, conference, enjoy the, the conference. So let's thank you, uh, uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Christian Weather again. Thank you very much, thank you, thank you.